Good study. What have you learned about Esther so far? Providence. Providence. Yep, yeah, that's it. Providence. God is working his plan all the time in every situation. And the book of Esther is one of the best books in the world to see the providence of God. And I mentioned before that God is not even mentioned once in the whole book of Esther. Not, the word God is not even mentioned in the book, and yet God is in the book, all through the book, constantly. So I guess he doesn't be that need to be mentioned when he's so clearly seen. What a great story the book of Esther is. And it's an incredible book in that there's a lot of unknowns about this book, and yet it's preserved for us to look at and realize that this was a time in history that it was a difficult time in history. It, it really was um, an, an event that took place where there was a lot of fear, anxiety, and there was a lot of worry, there was a lot of concern, there was a lot of stuff going on with a lot of people. And, and through it all, God was doing something miraculous. And think about your own life. They might be, you might be living a life with a lot of concerns and worries and a lot of turbulence and confusion and maybe there's a, a lot of actors in your life that you know, just don't, you don't understand why they're in your life and you might truly look at this book of Esther and be able to say, you know what? I can relate to this book, but God is at work. God is at work doesn't mean that uh, it's going to work out just perfectly. Because it could have not worked out perfectly for Esther. She could have perished. She could have not been used of God. God could have used someone else. She could have missed the blessings. She could have missed the whole story. And I wonder sometimes for us, if we're not walking according to God's providence, are we missing the story? Are we missing the event that God is up to. So we're going to look back into this story today. And chapter 4 is a new chapter for us. And we just pray that the Lord would bless his word today into our hearts. That we'd have full understanding. And we would acknowledge that, uh, Lord, you are ever present in our lives. As you were in Esther's life and Mordecai's life. So, Lord, use us tonight uh, when we walk out of here. To have the faith, the courage, the boldness, and uh, Lord, the, the faith to follow after you, Lord. We give our hearts to you tonight, Lord. Father, I know I know so well that I can do nothing in and of myself. I can only do everything through you, Lord. So Lord, I am fully surrendered for your purpose tonight. Talk to us, Lord. Just talk to us. Speak to us, Lord. Father, I thank you that uh, as we study your word, that it's not a matter of uh, just covering curriculum or trying to check off one more book that we study into our uh, register, Lord. But Father, we acknowledge that we come before you to see your face. We come before you to hear your voice. And we come before you to let it affect our lives. So we yield to you tonight. And we yield to the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Then Mordecai learned all that had happened. Now, Mordecai had learned all that had happened where? Back in chapter 3. And what had happened? Well, the king was deceived into believing that the Jews had to be dealt with and get, got rid of by a, a man named Haman, who was a friend of the king, who was elevated to the highest position in the kingdom, and now uh, has some 
some ability to manipulate the king. And we know that he offered the king a nice purse to have the king write a decree that all the Jews would be destroyed uh, off the face of the earth. And he writes this decree, and, and in the, in, with the Persian kingdom, once you write something and seal it, it can't be changed. It's a permanent deal. Uh, that's, that's what is going to happen to the Jews. And Mordecai has learned about this. I remember I said that Haman offered the king a purse. Now I look up the amount that was offered to the king and what it came out to be for, for us to understand, um, and this is going back to around 80, 1980 something's currency. I don't know what today's currency is, but in the 1980s, the currency of what Mordecai was offering the king was $25 million worth of silver. Nice purse. No wonder the king said, hey, I, where do I sign? Because the, the king was obsessed with showing off what he had. He was proud, arrogant, rude. He was selfish, self-seeking. Uh, the king had some issues. And so this, this nice purse that was offered to him moved his hand to sign and seal the decree that would annihilate the Jewish population. So verse 4, then Mordecai learned, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes, and who's Mordecai? That's his uncle who is a Jew. So when he learns of, of what had happened, the decree to annihilate all the Jews, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud voice and bitter cry. He put on sackcloth and ashes. He went to the midst of the city and he cried out loud with a loud voice. He cried out and he cried out with bitter cries. What would that sound? What would that sound like? Crying out loud with a bitter cry. Sackcloth and ashes. Now, Mordecai doesn't seem to have any problem grieving over what's going to happen to his people in public. Hmm. Mordecai has no problem grieving for his people in public. And what is happening is that Haman is going to annihilate the entire Jewish population and Mordecai's a Jew, and he's right in the middle of the city, and he's crying out as loud as he can, and wailing in bitterness as loud as he can, in sackcloth and ashes. Hmm. What if he's worried about peer pressure? Doesn't seem like it. Verse 2, it says, He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. No? Or ashes. So he can't enter the king's gate with sackcloth and ashes. So he goes right up to the gate with sackcloth and ashes and begins wailing and crying out loud with deep bitterness. Now the letter that went out to all the provinces so we have this entire area that we, we talked about. It, it goes from, uh, from Egypt up to uh, Turkey, all the way across, it cuts across the bottom of the Ukraine or Russia, and then it comes down and hugs around uh, Syria. It goes out into Iraq and Iran, 
down back into uh, part of India even, and then down into uh, back down into Egypt. So this is this entire region has gotten the memo that they're to kill every single Jew, man, woman, and child on this certain day a year from now. And Mordecai is grieving. But verse 3 it says, And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great what? Mourning, Mourning among who? The Jews. the Jews. With fasting, weeping, and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. In every province, I just described this region to you. Huge, gigantic region. And the whole Jewish nation, nation is mourning, fasting, weeping, wailing, and laying in sackcloth and ashes. That's the mood of the nation, of the entire kingdom. That's the mood. This is, this is trying to describe to us what this might have been like. It's something that we can't relate to. Not here in America. Uh, there's people that can relate to this in China. There's people that can relate to this in North Korea. There's people that can, re can relate to this in, in parts of uh, Northern Afghanistan. We can't relate to this. So it's hard for us to read a story like this and be moved. Because we have no idea what it's like to be so broken over the thought that there is going to come a day very soon that our entire faith and our entire faith nation is going to be annihilated. Um, now, part of this region, Jerusalem is in. And remember that the, the king prior to this king had sent, had given permission for the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild Jerusalem. So there is a great population back in Jerusalem and, uh, and that is rebuilding Jerusalem. Worshiping the Lord. So it's not just like, all right, we're going to have a remnant saved. No, we're going to, we got a big problem here. A big, giant problem. Verse 4 says, So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. The maids and the eunuchs, those are the ones who take care of the, the queen, they came and told the queen, listen, you're, they, they don't know the, that Mordecai's her uncle. They say, Mordecai's at the gate, he's in sackcloth and, and, and ashes, and he is wailing and grieving and howling out loud, and he's bitter cries, and not only that, but the whole entire kingdom of the Jews is in the same condition. So when Queen Esther hears this, what does she do? She sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him. Hmm. At this point, do you think she gets it? No, she doesn't get it. And why would she not get it? Think about that. Why would she not get what's going on? I don't think she can grasp the whole scope of this because she just got the news. So she's, she's been in the dark. It's not like the king came to her and said, hey, listen, uh, I just signed a decree and we're going to get rid of all the Jews. It seems like she's in her own little cocoon here in the kingdom, in her own little world, and she just finds out about this. And what she, she's trying to protect Mordecai. Uh, 
you can't be out there in sackcloth and ashes and wailing and crying out there in bitterness. Put these clothes on. What are you thinking? Verse 4 says, But he, Mordecai, would not accept them. What are the thems? The clothes. Is Mordecai serious and serious about what he's doing? Oh yeah, he's serious. His entire nation is about to be laughing. He's serious. Then Esther called Haddock, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her. And she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what, what and why this was. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know what's going on. All she knows is Mordecai is out of the gate crying and wailing and in sackcloth and ashes. She don't know what's happening. Think about that. She's the queen of the entire kingdom. And she don't know what's going on. Now, she wouldn't think anything like this could ever come from Haman. He's like, he's the king's best friend. He, he's a man that's noble. He's a man of dignity. and uh, She would never think that he would do something like this. Commanded Haddock. To go to Mordecai and find out what's going on. Go down there. This is too weird. This is crazy. Go down there and find out what is going on. I wonder if she would have the same concern as to what is going on if that wasn't her uncle. Maybe not. Does anyone see the providence of God? It had to be Mordecai, it had to be Esther. Uh huh. It had to be Mordecai at the king's gate. It had to be Esther in the king's palace, being a queen. Find out what's going on down there. So Haddock went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury to destroy the Jews. Now here is the first time that Esther is gonna find out what, Morde what Haman is really all about. This is the first time that Esther is gonna find out what Mordecai is crying about. This is the first time that Esther finds out what the entire kingdom is going to go through soon. Now, Esther is a Jew. She's a Jew. She should have some concern. Verse 6 says, And Haddock went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. We, we do Bible study, we read these scriptures, and we look at these chapters. Do you see the weight of verse 6 and 7? Do you see what has just taken place here? This isn't just some story. These are not just verse 6 and 7 of the fourth chapter of Esther. This is of an event that took place. These are real people, real feelings, real emotions, real fear, anxiety. But God is at work. So Mordecai, verse 8 also gave him a copy of the written decree 
for their destruction, which was given as Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her to go into the king's the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for the people. So Mordecai just lays it out. Lays it out clearly to Haddock. He even gave Haddock a copy of the papers, the decree. Here's what's going on. Esther, wake up. Wake up from your slumber. Come out of your pearls and rubies. Step out from amongst your perfumes. This is what's happening, Esther. The sky is really falling. Yeah. Verse 9, Haddock returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Wow. Then Esther spoke to Haddock and gave him a command for Mordecai. And here's what she said. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. I myself have not been called to go into the king for these, what? 30 days. 30 days. So it doesn't sound like the king and has to have a real deep love affair. We know that the king likes her. He found her to be beautiful amongst the others. He crowned her king. But he has, she hasn't even seen him for 30 days. And she knows if she goes before the king, if she's not called to go before the king, she could be put to death. That's the law. Unless he holds out the golden scepter. So he, she tells the eunuch to go back to Mordecai and tell Mordecai, listen, the law is I can't go see the king unless I'm asked. So basically, sorry, Mordecai. Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Esther. She really hasn't had time to think this through. She just learned it. She knows she's going to be killed if she does this. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Esther, you need to look at this situation. You're a Jew. Don't think for a minute that you're going to escape what's coming any more than anyone else. You're going down. But 14, verse 14. This verse is the verse of the whole book of Esther. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place. Now why would Mordecai make such a statement? If you refuse to do what I'm asking you to do, then help will arise for the Jews from other, some other place. Why would he say such a thing? 
because Mordecai is a Jew. Mordecai is a Jew that knows the, the fathers of the faith. He knows Abraham. Mordecai also knows the promise that was given to Abraham as a covenant. And the promise that was given to Abraham as a covenant meant that the Jews could not be destroyed. They could not be annihilated. That help was going to come from some other place. Mordecai knew this. So now, if Mordecai knows that, why is he bothering to pray and fast and, and mourn and grieve and wail in bitterness? Same reason you do that when you're having a tough time. You know that God has all the promises for you. He works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know that. You know that if God is for you, nobody can be against you. You also know that the gates of hell can't prevail against you. You know all the scriptures. You know all those scriptures. And yet, what do you do when you're in trouble? You cry out. And sometimes you wail in bitterness. It's what you do when your heart is grieved. It's what you do when your gut is wrenched. You cry out to the Lord. But he knows the promise. He knows the covenant. And he's, he's telling Esther, if you keep silent, relief and, and uh, deliverance is going to come from some other place. And he says, but you and your father's house, house will perish. Deliverance will come from another place. If you choose to be silent, deliverance is coming and relief is coming, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows if you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Don't sell the Lord short. Don't sell him short. Even if you don't see your purpose in this lifetime, you'll know your purpose when you go to be with the Lord. You'll know why. And we can easily say on earth because we're frail, we're weak, we're human. Our strength is weak. It's easy for us to say, why, Lord, why? And sometimes on this earth, you will see the why, but sometimes you'll have to wait. Sometimes you'll wait till you stand before the Lord and you'll go, oh, you had a plan. I forgot your plan never fails. Oh, I forgot that every other plan fails. You have a plan. You knew what you were doing, Lord. Amazing. I can't believe you actually knew what you were doing. Huh. And sometimes we really do live our lives as though we think God doesn't know what he's doing. Do you know that God's providence is in your life whether you like it or not? Well, why can't I be like them? Then they couldn't be them. You're you. Let them be them and you be you. Yeah, but why do I have to? Well, because God is God is sovereign. God has a plan. God has a wonderful plan. And we may not see it on this earth, but we will see it. We will see God's plan. So he tells Esther that who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther's a Jew. Esther is the queen. The king does like her. And so we've already been told that in the story that the king likes her. It is odd that she has become the queen, and she's a Jew. I know that Mordecai told her to lie, 
He didn't tell them a lie. He just told them not to say that she's a Jew. Oh, and by the way, Esther, don't mention you're a Jew. Here's Esther. Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. She, Mordecai's message comes to her basically telling her, listen, God's going to deliver the Jews, uh, but if you don't be the one that steps up to the plate, God's going to use somebody else, but you're going to perish, and your father's family is going to perish, and uh, we're going to be saved. But it's possible that the whole reason you are the queen is because of this situation. Because when he told her to go and try out for the queen gig, um, they didn't know this yet. So it wasn't like he said, go be the queen to save us. This just came up. So after that, verse 15, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. And this is what she says, go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night and day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So here is Queen Esther living the beautiful, spoiled life of a princess. Yeah. Queen. A queen. And all of a sudden, reality slips, just hits her in the face. And she's, she's been informed of something. She was clueless of. She has this dialogue with Mordecai. Mordecai makes the whole story clear to her. He just, he just says, boom, here you go, Esther. Here's the deal, completely. And she goes, oh, okay. You go and tell everybody in the city to fast. I'll take my, tell my maid servants to fast. We're gonna fast and we're gonna pray and, and we're gonna conquer this. She went from clueless to victorious. That could be us, you know. Clueless to victorious. Now, I want to take you to Daniel chapter 3. Remember, Esther said, if I perish, I perish. She's willing to be self-sacrificing for God's purpose. Self-sacrificing for God's purpose. Daniel chapter 13, verse 8, thir chapter 3, verse 18. 13, right? Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the harp, the flute, the, the, the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the soul trays in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning fiery furnace, and who is, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Nebuchadnezzar is a genius who's completely ignorant of the God of all creation. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Fiery furnace, right there, the king is giving them an out. All you gotta do is bow down and worship the golden image that I have set up and you're good to go. And they said, O Nebuchadnezzar, 
If we have, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. They have the same attitude that Esther has arrived at. It's called self-sacrificial life devoted to the purpose of God. Self-sacrifice. They could have got out of it and she could have got out of it. But they chose to serve the living God. Esther and Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea have something in common. They're both hidden believers. Esther, she's a hidden believer. But let's look at Joseph. In John chapter 19, verse 38, after this, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, aloe about a hundred pounds. I guess they had a wheelbarrow. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with stripes, with spices, and as the custom of the Jews is to bury. And uh, they buried them just like when, when Jesus was brought into the world, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. They had the same exact method when they buried. The new infant baby is, is wrapped up very carefully, all its, its, its hands, its, its arms, the baby's pretty much wrapped up like this so that a newborn baby can travel. Uh, it's almost like a mummy. The baby is, is able to stay together and not be shaken when it's brand new. And, but when they bury a, a, someone in that faith of that day, you would wrap every finger, then you'd wrap all the fingers, you'd wrap the whole arm, and then you'd wrap the torso, and then you'd put the arms like this and wrap the arms to the torso. You'd wrap each leg, each toe, and then you'd wrap the two legs together. That's how you would prepare someone for burial. And that, um, that cloth was saturated in herbs uh, to perfume the, the, the body, the body that is rotting. And so, they, they uh, asked for Jesus' body, they wrapped it, they prepared it. Now, verse 41, now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus, because the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. So uh, you see the similar, similarity between Esther and uh, Joseph of Arimathea. They both were undercover. Yes. And the Lord had them undercover for a very specific purpose. And sometimes God does have us undercover. And it's really fun when you're undercover when God decides the timing to expose you. I don't know about you, but I've had many times where I didn't realize I was undercover until I was exposed. And then I see the purpose of God bringing me undercover. undercover. Now, um, I think about that when we used to go into the prisons and do uh, prison ministry with the band. And we'd uh, go in there 
and we were instructed by the prison ministry, listen, I want you guys to go out in the yard and play classic rock. Yeah, but we're Christians. I want you to play classic rock. No preaching, no Jesus stuff. Now, why would they want us to go into the prison, a prison ministry, to go into the prison and play classic rock and no preaching? Well, the day that we went into the prisons, this was planned way in advance, the prison would know and everything. On those days when we went into the prison, we set up like we set up a concert. I mean, it was full blown, like it was giant speaker towers and everything. And we played classic rock. Sure. But the days that we went into the prison, they opened the prison cells to allow the guys to come into the yard. It was like a day off. So they thought they were coming out to hear Leonard Skinner. So they're all coming out. Hey, 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 that was a great song. Get your motor running, get out of my highway. And so they'd come out. Now once they came out and we got their attention, then, then we talked to them about Jesus. So it was the Immaculate Deception. Now, <laughs> We were uh, undercover. We were undercover, but then when our cover was revealed, then you see the miracle of God, you see the providence of God, you see how God works. Yeah. And we did the same thing in when we had the biker ministry. We'd go, we, we, we would always search out the one percenters. Who are the one percenters? These are the hardcore biker games. And we would come, we would seek them out and find them, and then we'd minister to them. We'd serve them. We'd go to their parties, their keg parties, and we'd help them cook hot dogs and hamburgers, and we'd, we'd help them clean up and empty trash bags. And God was doing the work. So sometimes God has you undercover, but when you go undercover, be prepared that God is going to expose you at the right time for the right purpose. You will be used by God to do miraculous things. Now, if you are undercover, be careful that your covering doesn't consume you to be like that. Because if, it does, if you become like them, uh, you've missed your calling. They're supposed to be like you. Verse 17 of Esther. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. He got everybody on their knees. He got everybody worshiping the Lord. He got everyone praying and sackcloth and ashes, fasting three days, day and night, for the deliverance. Wait a minute, Mordecai. I thought you said that uh, the covenant with Abraham and God's going to deliver you. Why are you going to... Hey, we're praying. The queen's about to go into the presence of the king. Yeah, but God's got that covenant. Wait a second. Does that make us not get on our knees and pray for one another? Why do we lift each other up in prayer? Why do we pray for someone in the hospital? Why do we pray? Well, God's got this. He's the healer. He's the, you know, he's the great physician. He's the counselor. We don't have to pray. God wants to hear our heart in matters that concern us. So let's talk to him. Now, there's, there's some spiritual application in, in, in this story so far that we've seen. Now, look at it this way. Satan is the destroyer, right? Yes. The king is eating and drinking and enjoying life. Eating and drinking and enjoying life. Like people in the world today, eating and drinking and enjoying life while Satan's about to consume and destroy billions of people and take them to hell. Many people eating and drinking, 
enjoying life. And then some people could be like Esther. Oh, you're a believer. There's no doubt about it. But you're absolutely clueless as to what's going on in the world. You have no clue. There's things going on in the world. Israel is at war. There's things going on in the world. Our country is falling apart. There's things going on in the world, and we're not in sackcloth and ashes or grieving or praying. Are we like Esther? Clueless. But then again, are we like Esther when we find out and open our eyes and be willing to hear? Are we willing to be self-sacrificing for the cause of God? Yeah. Just things we can ask ourselves. Where do we fit into the story? How does this apply to our life? Can it apply to our lives? Are we the ones eating and drinking and being merry? Then it says, like in the days of Noah, people will be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Happy go lucky. We're Christians. There's more Christians being martyred today than any time in Christian the church history. Christian brothers and sisters right now today being murdered for their faith. Do we pray for them? Do we lift up our voices to the Lord? What is happening outside of our little circle, our little world? Sometimes we're like Esther. We're in our little kingdoms. We don't even know what's going on in the world around us. Just, oh, we got, hey, I'm happy. I got my little kingdom going on. Oh, God will take care of that. Oh, yeah, God got this. God's sovereign. Huh? Huh? God's told us to pray. We're to intercede for one another. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. Build one, one another up in the faith. Forgive one another. Love one another. I think the story of Esther is a wake-up call. I think it really is a wake-up call. I know it is to me. A wake-up call. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for chapter 4. And Lord, we look forward to uh, chapter 5, Lord. Continuing this story, this incredible story with so much application. Lord, let it be true in our lives, Lord. Father, Forgive us, Lord, because we, it's so easy for us to be uh, locked in our little cocoons, Lord, and not realizing that the events that have taken place are so prophetic and happening so rapidly, Lord, that it's quite possible, Lord, that in the very near future we could see things that only the the uh, saints before us hope to see, Lord. So, Lord, let us not be complacent. Let us not be apathetic. Father, help us to be vigilant, watchful, and willing to pray. Father, our prayers go before you as incense. It's a fresh-smelling aroma to you. So, Lord, teach us, show us, help us to truly pray, Lord, like we've never prayed before. And, Lord, um, it's our greatest tool. It really is. So help us, Lord. Get us all home safe today, Lord, and thank you for everyone who showed up. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.